here we are, episode five already of Meriwether's World, because no one has come from the future and stopped me. Uh, I continue to tap my inner Christian Slater and do this. Uh, kind of fun. Am I going live is the question. So, all right, I hope I'm live. Um, drinking wine, talking about mushrooms. Like I said, uh, in the past two weeks, I've been averaging somewhere around 17 mushroom re identification requests a day and decided it's time to teach people how to fish rather than just collect mushrooms and then tell, have me tell them what they are. Last week, we covered toadstools. We're going to do a refresher course quick on toadstools this week, and then we're going to move on to the next most common type, which is the shelf uh, bracket style mushrooms followed by the puffball mushrooms. Tonight's sponsor is really cool. It is Scout and Cellar Wines. It is a wine club where you can have really awesome wines sent to you uh, as often as you'd like. And what's really special about these wines and why I'm personally really loving them is they're what are called clean wines clean wines. What this means is they are simply fruit, water, yeast, and love. There is no preservatives, no extra sugar, no dyes, no colorants, things like that being put in there. It's just the basic, most pure form of wine. Uh, the wines are handpicked to meet these standards, and then you get to pick which of those that the wine guru picked you want sent to you. It's a pretty awesome deal. And they come in a really nice package and all insulated and everything, so they're taken care of. So tonight I am drinking a Cabernet Seven. I don't know how to say it, but this is my favorite type of wine. Okay, how are we doing? Uh, let me just swing over here. And as usual, we are joined by, whoops, by Minnie Weather as she frantically tries and keeps up with me and my babbling. Have you kept up with me in my babbling? The uh, thing's not loading. The thing is not loading. So we'll see what happens. Um, I also want to say to take care of last week's issue with the Max Headroom effect, I've added 100 feet of Cat6 Ethernet cable running through the house from the bedroom down here to the computer. So we shouldn't be having any Wi-Fi lag. OK. Let me just back up here. Whoops. A second, because I was... Oh, hello again. Okay. So, identifying mushrooms. Looking to see if anyone's joined us. I'm not seeing anyone. Uh, hopefully people are there. Like I said, last week we talked... Uh, whoop, I really need to need more buttons. Like I said, I'm constantly getting questions from people. Can I eat this? Uh, usually it's a bad single photograph of a mushroom without nearly enough details. So like I said, I'm going to show you how to look at a mushroom and what parts of the mushroom you need to look at so you can decide for yourself if you can eat the mushroom. Uh, breaking them into basic categories, the toadstools are the traditional mushroom mushroom you see that this is what i'm referring to when i talk about a toadstool and then the shelf bracket type are the type that are growing on wood and then i don't have examples of puffballs with me or the jelly gooey type or what i affectionately call the what the hell mushrooms mushrooms come in a variety of shapes and so it's just one of those things that a lot of things that look like alien species infesting your flower beds are probably a mushroom. All right, like I said, we want to start again just by a refresher course on what to look at to identify a toadstool so that later on when you see a strange toadstool in your yard, you will be able to identify it on your own. Now, what I'm teaching you is what parts to look at that you need to uh, know and be able to flip through the books to find which mushroom you are looking at. So the main thing with the mushroom are the structural features, the structures of the mushrooms. So you can see I have them listed here, the caps, the scales, the gills, the spores, the stem or stipe, the veil, the base, the vulva. Not all these structures will be on the mushroom that you're looking at, 
but uh, whether they are or aren't is a big key for identifying the mushroom. And just checking here, have I gone live? Checking, I don't know what's going on here. Hmm, I may have to start over. How are we doing here? Nothing here. Nothing. Uh, I got it going here. Got it going here. Do, do, do. Check again. Read all the posts, but no conversation. Hmm. All right. Why? Live. 28 seconds. When you spend a lot of time in the woods, technology sometimes advances without you. Call me Rip Van Winkle. Meriwether Van Winkle. Not a bad idea. All right, do we have, oh, oh, there we go. There we go, we got some people. All right, people that have just joined, should I start over? Tina Marie and Joe Barnes, let me know, should I start at the beginning? And it'll take a second for the stuff to get to them, um, but we will see. But you know what, I am going to start at the beginning just because I'm that sort of guy. Okay, so identifying mushrooms. Like I said, in the past week, two weeks, about 12 times a day, someone sends me some strange, bad picture of a mushroom wanting to know if they can eat it or otherwise imbibe it for different medicinal uses. So rather than continue to spend a lot of time just trying to figure out what these strange little bad photographs are that don't show the structures, I'm going to go through and teach you what you need to look at at mushrooms to figure out what you have. All right, breaking the mushrooms into basic categories. I break them up into toadstools, like, you know, your basic Mario Brothers supper time mushroom. Then we have the shelf bracket mushrooms, these big weird things that grow on the sides of trees. We have the puff balls, which are these assorted round ones you find all over the woods and fields. I don't have an example of that. We have the jelly or gooey mushrooms, which are uh, things that look like someone smeared a structural jelly on some surface and it seems to have come alive and started growing. And then even weirder than the jelly or gooey mushrooms, we have what I call the what the hell mushrooms, which are just strange alien looking creatures, usually showing up in your flower beds and causing some concern often. But in most cases, there's nothing to be worried about. Okay, last week we talked about identifying toadstools because that's one of the most common things that's been popping up around Texas and around the North America with all the rains we've been having. Um, so I just want to go back and refresh people on how they identify a toadstool, what structural features they need to look at. And the, from the structural point of view, it's the cap, the scales, the gills, the spores, the stem, the stipe, veil, base, and vulva. And we'll go over each one of those individually quickly. But uh, the absence or appearance of these structures are going to be very specific to a species. And so uh, that will help you determine what you have. So the cap, again, we're looking at this top part. You know, this is the cap. Uh, and things you want to look at that is what color is the cap, what shape is the cap, how big is the cap, you know, the basic features, because all those are going to change dependent on the species of the mushroom. The next thing are the scales. And if we look underneath here, in here, under the gill is where the scales are. Or, sorry, sorry, sorry. Scales are the dandruff, sorry, on the top of the mushroom. So if you see a mushroom with weird patches, you know, like, I have on my head. I'm not a mushroom, but I do have weird patches on my head. Those are the scales, and the absence or presence of scales helps you determine which mushroom you have. Now, the gills are these structures there inside the cap. I don't know if you can see those, but those are the gills. So, and then the gills, there is a true gill, a false gill, a, a pores, a teeth. There's different structures that play a role in just what sort of gill it is. And again, that gill structure is species specific. The spores. Mushrooms drop their baby mushrooms from the gills. 
And these things are the, the baby producers. They drop these individual cells down, which then, if they land in a good area, grow to new mushrooms. Now, the color of the spore is really important in identifying very similar looking mushrooms because a lot of times the color again is going to be specific to the species and along with the color if you really want to get down into the weeds and really figure out what's going on you would look at the spores under a microscope and see what shape they are because that's going to play a role now the stem do we have a question mm -hmm. Okay, feel free to read the questions out loud when they come up like that. But uh, let me just, oops. Uh, what did you find? Japanese and Christmas later. Okay, going through quick. Uh, can you take a spore print, please? Okay, taking a spore print involves, oops, removing the cap. Just a minute. I need a knife for this. Okay. So you remove the cap, which I'm doing off screen. Okay, oops. So I have the cap, there's the cap. I remove the stem and you set it down on some paper. I actually prefer to use microscope slides, but set it there and let it sit overnight and the spores during the course of the night will drop from the mushroom, the gills and land on the microscope side and then you can just look at the color so very very handy that way now the stem which i just cut off here uh, different features on that is the size the thickness the shape is there any patterns you can see this one has scales again all these individual structures are going to be specific to a species of the mushroom and i got mushroom goo all over my keyboard not the first time the veil the veil is the remnants of a sheath that covers the gills when the mushroom is still young before the cap has opened up and so sometimes there will be remains of the veil stuck to the stem or the stipe so the again species specific is there a veil that will tell you a lot and then is the veil dangling down if there is one present or is it pointing upwards these are all structures that stay consistent within the particular species of a mushroom so is there a veil is there not a veil if there is a veil is it pointing up or is it pointing down okay then the base and this is a good example of that is the base swollen is the base straight is it you know but connected to a bunch of other mushrooms do you have individual mushrooms growing or are they all fused at the base and you have multiple mushrooms again that tells you or gives you information you need to identify the mushroom then finally the vulva that is the original egg sac for the mushroom before it comes up out of the ground and again there may be a vulva or they may not it's species dependent so you're seeing all these structures are dependent on the specific species of the mushroom and the toadstool so those are the things you need to look at to identify what mushroom you have okay now let's take a moment to talk about tonight's wonderful uh can i get this on there uh sponsor it is wine and not just any wine it is what is called the scout and scout and cellar clean crafted wine and this is a wine club where each month they give you a selection or maybe even more than each month but they have a constant selection of clean wines and what it means to be a clean wine is a wine that has no additives it is just fruit water yeast and love there's no uh, added extra sugar there's no gmo fruit there is no dyes or any extra adulterants that people add to a lot of what's going on here not long uh, oops, just a minute minor problem uh, sorry i don't know what's going on here um i am still just trying to broadcast these things from really well, my kitchen table here or dining room table um eventually i will try and have a better 
studio. But going back to the wine, which has nothing to do with the technical errors. Like I said, the clean crafted wines from Scout and Cellar, they are no, no extra added sugar, no dyes, no colorants, nothing but the yeast, the fruit, the water, and love. And they are a really cool thing. They come delivered right to your door in a very special insulated package so that there's no damage of any sort done to the wine and you can get them you know weekly monthly however special orders uh i believe a link is going to be put up in yes the whole thing uh the consultant that i work through is doreen and uh hopefully she's on here i don't know why is this doing that um I don't know what's going on here. Okay, but continuing on. Another question. That's, ooh, a question. I like so, questions. Miss Vortech is saying, are you saying that mushrooms could be identical except for their gills go up or down? Or identical except for just one of these criteria? Yes. Or very, yeah. So the question was, uh, can mushrooms, different species, be identical except for say the absence or presence of a veil or true or false gills or any one of these, you know, just one individual uh, component. And the answer is yes. It's, um, you know, uh, even like different, the difference between edible and deadly mushrooms, they look the same, except there's some subtle difference in the gills. Now, it's subtle to the uninitiated, but once you start learning the mushrooms, it's actually quite easy to identify them. Uh, as long as you're willing to spend the time. And that's the trick. You got to go and match all these things to what you're looking at to make sure you have what you're, you're looking at. Okay, we talked about wine. Uh, any other questions? Nope. All right, moving on. So crossing toadstools off the list, now we're going to move on to the shelf bracket mushrooms. What do you need to do to identify that? Because there are a lot of really interesting shelf and bracket mushrooms out there. And what I mean by a shelf or bracket mushroom is these big, weird disc-shaped oyster shell looking things that you often see growing on the side of trees, especially dead trees. And so, like I said, there's a lot of useful mushrooms that fall into this category. And so I want to show you what you need to know and what you need to look at to identify what shelf bracket mushroom you have. And it boils down to the ecosystem it's growing in, the structures of the mushroom itself, and then some other impressions that are important that you need to know about the, the mushroom or observe about the mushroom. Okay, so ecosystems. Where do you find these shelf mushrooms? The number one place you are going to find the shelf mushrooms is going to be on dead trees. If you find it on a live tree, that means the tree is actually almost dead. It's hanging on, but it will be dead soon. Um, I can't think off the top of my head, really, any of the shelf fungus, except for maybe chaga, which doesn't grow in Texas, that doesn't grow on dead trees. And even if it's growing on a live tree, it's maybe growing on a dead branch, but it grows on the dead branch because its purpose is to break that wood down and return it to the soil. Now, different mushrooms will have different preferred trees that they want to grow on. Um, at the very minimum, you want to know if you're looking at a hardwood tree or a softwood. Just to remind, the hardwoods are things like oaks, maples, hickories, sweet gums, hackberry. Think of it, if it loses its leaves in the winter, it's probably a hardwood. Now, on the softwood side, that is the pine and the cedar, mainly down here in, in Texas and most of the other parts of the country, too. But there are a number of mushrooms that will only grow on dead hardwoods or others that only grow on dead pine or dead softwoods. And then there are others that are opportunistic and just as long as the wood is dead, they're on it. Okay, the other thing then in the ecosystem is the season. There are some mushrooms that are hot weather time of the year, others that are cold weather part that show up in the spring or fall. In Texas, there are some that only show up in the winter, but then you also have ones that show up 
over the course of multiple years and keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. A lot of times the size of the mushroom is going to be a good indicator of is it a one season sort of mushroom or is it a multi-year sort of mushroom? Because if it keeps growing and growing and growing year after year after year, they can get really, really big. So again, in the ecosystem, you need to know, you know, possibly if you can identify the tree that you found the mushroom on, or at least identify if it is a hardwood or a softwood. And then, you know, does it look like it's uh, very specific to a season? Is it small and looks like it's relatively fresh or does it look like it's been there for a while? Got a okay, question. got a question. Yep, Miss um, Gracie asks, are there any edible mushrooms in Texas associated with cedar? Hmm. Any edible mushrooms associated with cedar? In Texas. In Texas. You know, off the top of my head, I'm having a hard time thinking of any. Um, partially because in my general areas I haunt, uh, I don't see many cedars that are dead. I don't get up to the hill country nearly enough to see up in the, you know, the, the Texas cedar. Um, one thing that does pop in my head is the turkey tail mushrooms, which is a, a shelf uh, bracket fungus, and it seems to grow on everything everywhere. I've seen them all over the world in a number of different trees, dead trees. Um, so I'm guessing there are, but unfortunately, I don't know the true answer to that question. Sounds like I need to do some more research. Okay, so ecosystem, like I said, what tree is it on? And what season is it growing in? Oops, okay. Uh, next, we need to start to look at the structures and we wanna look at the top of the, the, the shelf fungus, we wanna look at the underside and we wanna note the colors. So looking at the top, there are different features we want to see on the top that will help us figure out what species is. First off, is it smooth? Is it hairy? Does it have stripes? So you can see on the leftmost, uh, we have the turkey tail with all sorts of weird stripes on it. In the center, we have the artist conch, which is a smooth, featureless uh, sort of mushroom. And then on the right, we have another gandoderma that is hairy on top. So the surface of the top, what is it like? Is it striped? Is it hairy? Is it smooth? All that you need as part of your process of identifying the bracket mushroom. Then we move to the underside, uh, looking at the gill structure. And so let me just uh, do, 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 go back here. Oh, whoops, that's the top. Looking at the bottom, we're looking, you know, what sort of structures are there. So going back to here. All right, so there are different possibilities with the underside of the mushroom. Uh, first, is it a polypore? If we look at the, does this show up? Eh, it doesn't show up. My mouse doesn't show up, that's a bummer. Uh, if it has just a bunch of tiny holes on the underside of the, the mushroom, that is a polypore. Sometimes you need to look with a, micro, a magnifying glass to see if those holes are there, uh, but usually they're fairly noticeable to the visible to the, the naked eye. Another type, moving clockwise to the 12 o'clock position, we have the toothed uh, shelf bracket mushrooms, where instead of gills, they just have, it looks like rows and rows of teeth or comb uh, pointy parts of the comb hanging down, like a, lots of little needly teeth. And that is a toothed mushroom. We can also have more traditional gills, which are directly below the tooth where you have, I mean, this isn't a shelf mushroom, but it can have the same sort of gills that a gilled mushroom has. And then finally, a crust. If it looks like there is a you know, just a crust, a film, a layer of thick paint on the, usually on the dead wood that then flips up to form a secondary structure. That is a crust. And you can see that in the far right there. So any questions on this? Actually, we've got a lot of questions on the trees. Oh, the trees. Yep. Uh, 
Uh, Miss Sarah Lewis asks, are there any associated with pine trees in East Texas? Yes. Uh, go back to me. Hi. Pine trees. There's a number of good uh, mushrooms that I find on the pine trees, including the turkey tails and some of the uh, the lion's mane, the uh, bear's head tooth, the hercium mushrooms that are quite tasty. Uh, one of the big ones, though, is the reishi mushroom, which is not so much edible, but extremely medicinal. And so the reishi mushroom is probably my favorite find on pine trees. All right. Uh, another question by Mr. McFadden. What tree would make a shelf slash bracket toxic? Ah, good question. What tree would make a shelf uh, bracket fungus to toxic? Um, the two I would be most concerned about uh, don't really grow down here, so that's not such a bad thing. But the eucalyptus tree... Uh, there are a number of edible mushrooms that grow on lots of trees, but when they grow on a eucalyptus tree, they actually pick up toxicity uh, that you don't want. Um, another would be the cypress tree, uh, just because there's a number of toxic molecules in the cy cypress tree. Uh, they're fine if you're making a table or something like that out, but you don't want to eat something that's been growing on it. That being said, the cypress tree are generally pretty resistant to fungus, so I haven't seen any on there. Um, but those are the two big ones. In general, there's really none that I can think of that the particular tree is toxic enough to cause an effect on the mushroom. Um, generally, it's going to be the mushroom itself that has some sort of toxicity. Pardon me. Okay, any other? Oh, okay, moving on, moving on. Okay, so we talked about the underside. Is it a polypore tooth, gills, crust? A lot of the same sort of structures that would be on the toadstools. It's, nature repeats itself whenever it can. Okay, another thing is the color of the mushroom is it going to be pure white is it going to be multiple colors is it going to be really weird colors but the color is going to be mushroom specific and a good clue to the type of mushroom and so you want to look at the structure both on the top and the underside of the mushroom and those will help you identify it i mean a lot of this is kind of self-explanatory my wife has a, a saying it's self-explanatory once someone tells you but these are the things you actually need to look at. And so if you send me a picture of just the top of the mushroom, I'm going to say, I need more information. You know, send me the underside too. But hopefully after this, you'll be able to figure them out on your own. Okay, another structural feature, or sorry, now we're moving on to the impressions. And the big one is the texture of the mushroom. Is it firm? Is it rubbery? Is it slimy? Is it gooey? Is it... You know, what does it feel like? Uh, what we have here on the uh, left, well, it's my left. I'm not even sure what side it is on your, but the, the one with the ruler that says, well, behind it says titanium, but the brown kind of mushroom with the gray top, and I want to point to it. This is a little frustrating. Um, on the left, we have the what's called the woods ear mushroom, and it is a very gelatinous sort of mushroom when it's fresh and growing. On the right-hand side, that kind of gray with the black interior, that's actually the woodsy ear again. But when the rains go away and the soil dries up, the woodsy ear have a tendency to shrink and dehydrate and become a very hard sort of mushroom. Uh, at that point, you can still pick them and throw them in hot soup and they will swell up. But really, you need to know what is the texture of the mushroom? Because that's going to be another key well, feature, impression that you need to identify the mushroom. All these things are necessary to figure out what you have. Like I mentioned last week, there's over 5 million different mushrooms out there, and there's a lot of uh, subtle mimics. So you really need to you know, look at all these eight or more features of the mushrooms to figure out what you have. Okay. Let's go back to Scout and Cellar quick. Like I mentioned earlier, and this is 
the wine I'm drinking, and it's a very good wine. So what are their features? Like I said, they're grown naturally, no GMOs, no pesticides, nothing like that. They are very clean, crafted wine. There's nothing bad in them. The farms, what do you call a, a winery? I guess the grape yards where they grow them have to be certified organic so that there's you know, never been any pesticides or herbicides or anything used in the last, I'm not sure how many years it is, but it's quite a while. But they're only allowed to use natural fertilizers and things of that nature. Um, I will vouch for the deliciousness of them. I've had several now and they've all been absolutely spectacular. A lot of the work on these wines is done by hand. So they're small vats with small wineries, very specific uh, goals of this whole clean wine sort of thing and zero chemicals. Uh, there's actually 250 uh, additives that the FDA has approved for use in wine and the craft and seller wines that they you know, sell have none of them. So they're just uh, a really clean wine and really, really good. Okay. Do we have a question? Oh. Oh. I thought, I thought we had, had a question. question. So, so back, back to me. <laughs> and I'm just going to vouch for this wine here. Mm. Okay. Next up, identifying puffballs. Because this is... Whoops. This is another very common sort of mushroom that people find a lot. And so what structures do you need to look at to identify a puffball? So... Like before, and like every case, you need to look at the ecosystem, the structure, and the impressions uh, that you get from the mushrooms, because all these are what you need to know, starting with the ecosystem. Now, with the puffballs, it can be a little more varied. Uh, they will be growing on dead wood. I've never found any on live wood, and I don't know of any that have ever really been recorded being found on live wood. Their purpose is to break the wood down. But so dead woods of all types, pines and hardwoods and softwoods, uh, is the one place you'll find them. You'll also find them in open fields and yards uh, where there is no dead wood. There's just grass or small other plants where they're growing there. But again, the ecosystem, the ones that are growing on dead woods are different than the ones, are different species than the ones growing in the grass. They may look the same, but they are different. And so you need to know where yours are found. Okay, structure, the surface of this puffball. Those puffballs, they are round. They don't have an underside, they're, they're round. <laughs> so it's all just the surface that you're looking at. In that case, you wanna know, is the surface smooth? Is it bald? Imagine I was bald, actually don't imagine that. It's kind of scary looking. Uh, are there weird bumps or pyramids or other structures in a repeating pattern on the mushroom? Or is there just an odd pattern in the skin itself? Uh, all these, again, believe it or not, are important to figure out which puffball you have. Um, side note, the true puffballs are all edible, but there are other puffball mimics that uh, are not edible. They're poisonous, and so you need to make sure what you have is a true puffball. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go into this. Okay, so the structures. Is it smooth? Is it bumpy? Or does it have some sort of pattern ingrained in the surface? Uh, and the structures, uh, the true puffballs, they have a very important key characteristic that tells you, yes, this is a true puffball and therefore something I can eat. And that is if you cut it in half, the inner surface is going to be homogenous. It's going to look like you cut a marshmallow in half. It's going to be white and just every point of it is going to be the same. So here I got a, a close up of a puffball that's cut in half and then one of the bumpy types that was cut in half. And again, the key thing here is if it is homogenous, white, it is a good edible mushroom. Now, if you cut it in half and there are visible structures of some sort, if it is no longer homogenous, if it is non-homogenous, that is a false puffball and it is uh, poisonous. 
or otherwise not a true puffball. So on the left here, we have what's called an earth star, uh, where if you cut it in half, it has a thin white ring of flesh, but then the interior is a permanently a black color. So those are poisonous. You, what you found there is just a, fa a false puffball. When I was out at Cato Mounds this last weekend, there was all these puff grounds, puff balls in the in the yard there, and we picked a few, and all of them were the Earth Star, and so we just gave up. Uh, along with uh, having just a color thing, if you see bands on the right there, that is called a cramp ball mushroom, and those are somewhat medicinal, but really the difference between medicine and poison is dosage. Uh, and they're not edible. But if it looks like you cut this puffball in half and it has the structure of an onion, that's again not an edible puffball. Really bad is if you cut the puffball in half and you see baby gill structures, because most likely that is one of the really super poisonous mushrooms, like a death cap or a uh, destroying angel, some of the um, uh, amin amin aminita mushrooms that are really, really, really poisonous. If you pick a, a puff ball and cut it in half and you see something like this with gills, drop it, go wash your hands, go wash your knives, you know, just make sure you have nothing there. How are we on questions? Any questions? No questions. Oh, wait, no, wait, we have a question. Ah, question. I love questions. All right. So she says, maybe I missed it, but was there a more in-depth explanation of the difference between false gills and actual gills? Okay. Yes, there was a description or an in-depth discussion of true gills and false gills, but it was last week. So what I recommend is scrolling down the Foraging Texas Facebook page to the videos and rewatch last week's uh, show. And the first half was an in-depth discussion of the structures of toadstools. And that will give you what you need to know. Okay, so going back here, uh, just as an aside, this, these structures here, these are what are called false gills. The gill structure is very distinctly a different tissue than the cap itself. So if you see here, the gills are kind of a pinkish color, whereas the cap itself is white. That is a, uh, that's one of the indicators that you have a true gill there. Whereas a false gill, the cap material and the gill material is all one continuous piece. But if you cut open a puffball and you see gills, drop it. Oops. Okay. Ah. Um, so, Miss Lewis is asking, should you use gloves when hunting the puffballs? Wearing gloves when you hunt mushrooms in general is overkill once you have an idea. Uh, I really recommend, and I will put links up to identify them. Note to self, put links up to identify some of the really poisonous mushrooms. There's no mushrooms that will kill you or really make you sick just by touching them. You actually have to consume them. A lot of the poisons in mushrooms, not all of them, but a fair number of them, the molecules themselves aren't the poison. It's what your body turns them into while it's trying to break the mushrooms down. So the truly the only real way you're going to poison yourself with a mushroom is by uh, consuming it. Now, that being said, the spores of these poisonous mushrooms can also be very poisonous. And if you have a mixture of you know, mushrooms with gills, with puffballs, and they drop their gills onto the puffballs, there can be a problem there. Uh, so really the key is identify the mushroom before you put it in the basket that you're collecting your mushrooms with. But in the case of the puffballs in particular, there are really none that's going to cause any sort of problems by touching them. And even the earth stars, once you see it's an earth star and you've cut it open, you see that black and white... Uh, Hello.
but you don't have to worry about you know burning your take a few precautions, especially don't don't put an unknown mushroom in your pool if no one's there. Okay. Um, another thing that comes into play with the especially true puff balls, the spores of the puff balls are produced inside the mushroom and then eventually the outer surface kind of tears open and decays and you know you still kind of puff the, the spores in. Um, so, everyone wants to eat puff balls, right? How's that? Can you hear me? I think so. I think I bumped something here, but okay. So going back to one of the keys, when you do find an edible puff ball, you've cut it in half and it has that homogenous structure. There's no sign of, you know, white and black. There's no sign of rings. There's no sign of gills. It just looks like you cut a mushroom, but that, uh, sorry, cut the marshmallow in half, but the marshmallow is looking somewhat discolored, uh, especially more towards the center and working its way out towards the edges of the true puffball. That means that puffball has switched over to spore manufacturing. And so the interior now is filled with the spores of the puffball. And as it just ages, it'll get darker and darker. Usually it'll turn a dark yellow or dark green sort of color. But if you see a coloring going on in the true puffball, it's too late to eat. It's already produced spores and these spores can make you sick if you uh, eat them. So you want to make sure that the puffball, after you've already positively identified it as a puffball, that it is still a young puffball before you start eating it. We've got one question. So, um, this guy asked, do you carry slash use multiple knives in case of contact with a bad one, bad puffball? Okay, good question. Actually, I do not. Um, first off, I have a good idea of what I'm picking before I pick it, and if I don't know what it is, all I will do is get lots of pictures from different angles and uh, things like that. And then uh, occasionally I will cut it open to see if it has the true gills or the false gills. But after that, I just wipe down the, the knife. Just wipe it good with the cloth. Um, and that's going to remove any of the toxicity. It's not going to stick to the knife. Um, you know, I don't lick the knife. So I just use one single knife when I'm doing all this. Then, you know, it's... Traditionally, what the, the mushroom hunters do, especially once they know what's in the area, they know what they're after before they even head out. But just basic you know, cleanliness, wiping it on my pants leg is plenty enough because usually you have to consume a fair amount also to really have problems. Okay. Oops. But again, with the puffballs, uh, you want to eat them when they are early. You don't want to wait until the interior is starting to discolor, turning a yellow or a green or a brown, anything like that. Okay, so just to refresh on what is an edible puffball. If the interior is a homogenous white when you cut it in half, like you cut it, you know, cut a giant marshmallow in half, if there are no internal structures, if again, if it is um, white and homogenous and nothing else but whiteness, um, as far as the ecosystem, it doesn't matter if those first two things are found. It doesn't matter if it's growing on a tree or in the grass. It's one of the edible puffballs. Traditionally, the puffballs are the starter mushrooms for uh, any mushroom hunters. And in case you're wondering who the guy next to me is, that's my younger brother. Uh, I'm an inch taller than him. Ha. Okay. So that, let me bring this back up here. How much time do we have? Oh, wow. We went 45 minutes. So that is an introduction into the, the bracket shelf mushrooms and the puffball mushrooms. So I'm hoping that will help you again, like I said, understand what features you need to look at the mushroom so that then you can identify it yourself uh, using assorted books. Uh, one thing I have, and we'll put up a link here, is uh, I have an Amazon store. It's Amazon slash shop slash foraging Texas. 
And in there, there are assorted groups of books. And there is, doo -doo -doo, let me just bring this up here. Oops. There is a section devoted to mushrooms. And give me a second while this comes up. The Amazon. All uh, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oops. So mushrooming. And so there are some books that I strongly recommend and some gear that I recommend. And I've said it before, but for the, uh, the best book I've found for identifying wild mushrooms is the 100 Edible Mushrooms by Michael Coe. And what I love about this mushroom book is he starts you in the grocery store and you dissect some mushrooms there and you learn, you know, true gill, false gill, stipe, cap shapes, colors, patterns, all these sort of things, all these structures that I was talking about. He shows you exactly what it is on a mushroom that hopefully the Kroger produce manager has already you know, properly identified. And when they say it's a portobello mushroom, it is a portobello mushroom. But once you understand the structures and shapes and all that, uh, that you need, then you head off into the woods and find 100 of the, really the best edible mushrooms in North America. This book covers not just Texas, but all of North America, but quite a few of these mushrooms are found here. Um, so that's, that's one of the key ones. Let me just bring this back. There's also the Texas mushrooms, which is actually in my car right now. Uh, the Texas mushrooms book. Oops. Let me bring this up. It is, again, it's a field guide to Texas mushrooms. It does not cover every mushroom you're going to find in Texas, but it's a good starting point to help you figure out what you have. So that's really important, at least because a lot of times just knowing where to start, what it might be, is really, really important. And then the National Audubon Society Mushrooms book. Uh, this one, it's a upper level mushroom book. I mean, you, you, it has a key guide. It's fairly complex, but you kind of work your through the different features of the mushroom until it tells you, you know, what it likely is. So mushrooming, learning mushrooms, is not just a quick glance at it thing. There are some mushrooms uh, that fall in that category where it is a quick, easy uh, find, especially here in Texas. And I'm just scrolling. Do, 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 do. Where is, oh, mushrooms. So currently on foraging texas i have 12 different mushrooms with all sorts of pictures and uh, like here you can see this particular puff ball is already starting to go bad it, it was homogenous white but now it's starting to pick up that kind of greenish color but the 12 mushrooms i currently have are like i said all really easy to identify and tell apart from mimics uh, there's a few more i plan on adding when i have time it's just a matter of getting the time to do that Okay, so uh, I'm going to take a minute again to talk about the wine because the Craft and Cellar, if you've been following around, they are tonight's sponsor. It is a clean crafted wine. And one of the cool things is the, if you use the link I posted there that, uh, that goes to their website, um, they send me free wine. So I don't make any money doing this, but hey, free wine? It's almost as good as money, uh, as they say, and I'll drink to that. All right, so we have 10 minutes left. Uh, a couple of questions for the audience. First off, is this useful? Um, I know most of you would rather just send me a, one bad picture of a mushroom and have me tell you what it is and if you can eat it, um, but that's not really a great use of my time. Show so, oh, show the label. So this particular one I'm drinking tonight is, and I have no idea how to pronounce it, but it is an Argentinian wine uh, from the Scout and Cellar. Is the the person, the the company that goes through and searches the world for these clear, clean, crafted wines, uh, and then brings them to your doorstep, really. Um, 
where was I? Oh, so yeah, so let me know if this format is working for you. Uh, in the future, some of uh, I think we've kind of talked most of the mushrooms to death. I can continue a little bit more on the jelly and the, uh, you know, the, the what the hell mushrooms, but it really boils down to the same sort of thing where, you know, we need to know the ecosystem it's growing in. We need to look at all the different structures of the mushroom and other impressions. And that's what you need to identify the mushroom. So I think if you've watched these last two shows, you have an idea of going forward, uh, what, you should be looking at. So I'm thinking next week we will either talk specifically about the medicinal properties of certain mushrooms, or we could talk about the medicinal properties of landscaping plants. So let me know, hit me up uh, just in the comments. And <laughs> my daughter hates it when I say hit me up. Um, I don't know why. She just hates the fact that I'm cool and hip and all that. Oh, anyway. Yeah, so let me know what you want next week's show to be about, and then we will try and work something out on that. Otherwise, do we have any other questions as I turn the camera over to Miniweather? All right, scrolling down, somebody asks, are there any mushrooms that are poisonous to eat but very medicinal? Ooh. So, question, can, are there poisonous to eat but still medicinal mushrooms? Um, no, <laughs> uh, the poisonous mushrooms, they just, to my knowledge, nothing that I've ever found. And I, oh, I need to put this on here. The Myco Medicinal Books by Paul Stamets. Uh, I think I have a link there. Um, this covers a lot of the, you know, the actual proven scientific medicinal uses of a number of mushrooms. Um, in this, there are none that are the poisonous, you know, any of the amanitas. Um, and I'm not sure how quickly to say. I guess the closest would be some of the hallucinogens, uh, hallucinogenic mushrooms, that there's been a lot of work done recently that shows it helps rewire the brain to uh, de-depression people. Uh, but that's something I have not looked deeply into. Um, I'm one person with limited time, so there's only so much I can and do on a day. Um, but long story short, no, as far as the poisonous mushrooms, there aren't any that are medicinal. Now, a number of the medicinal mushrooms, I will say, taste terrible, absolutely terrible, but they do have good medicinal uses, so, both internally and externally. Uh, the reishi mushroom is one of the big ones. Um, just absolutely bitter flavor, but incredibly medicinal. Okay, do we have any other questions? Yes, uh, Mr. Shane, because your last name is very complicated, much like mine. If a true puffball had some color, could you cut the colored part out and eat the rest? Good question. Can you cut away the colored part? If it's still you know, basic rule of thumb, it, basically when I'm out there hunting mushrooms, if the colored center is smaller than about 25% of the entire surface of the mushroom, I will very carefully cut out the outer area and eat that. But, you know, 25%, I'm, you know, it's like the thumb tip here in a circle there. And it'll be dark in the center and faded. There can't be any discoloring more than 25% of the way from the center. So it has to be just the, just the very beginning, really. Okay. Any other questions? Is, um, it? is it obvious when a puffball is past its prime? Yes. And let me bring this up. Okay. So here we have the giant puffball. Oops. And if you can see this, how this one is already starting to yellow, it's expanded well beyond the center 25%. So it's going to be very, very noticeable. Uh, and then eventually they actually turn gray, their surface starts splitting. If this was artisanal bread, it would look kind of good. But if you're touching the puffball and it's setting up puffs of smoke, 
then yeah, that's uh, that's past due. Okay, do we have another question? Yep. Oh, What's good. your favorite animal noise? My favorite animal noise is the call of the giraffe. I strongly recommend you Google it and find out just the sound that giraffes make. It's uh, kind of unique in the animal world, really, and there's a lot of weird noises out there. All right, one last one. Uh, Mr. Rust asks, would the off-color harm you? I assume if you ate it. Yeah, so the off-colored, that is the spores, and they have their own defensive mechanism. Uh, they don't like to be eaten. So you would probably, even with a really good edible puffball, uh, if it's starting to discolor, you would, at the very minimum, get a stomach ache and quite possibly diarrhea or vomiting, depending on uh, how many of the spores you consume, consumed. So really, if there is discoloring, I, I don't recommend it. One of the nice things about puffballs is when they show up, there's usually a lot of them at different stages of growth. So you can kind of poke around and see, you know, look for the smaller ones. They're going to be younger. And that way you avoid the problem to begin with. All right. And then Miss Nikki asks, can I get spores from my reishi and propagate it? Oops. Yes, reishi are some of the easiest to propagate. Uh, what I've found, if you find a good, healthy reishi, let me just bring up a reishi here. Boom. Uh, you find a good, healthy reishi. Why didn't that not go? Just a minute here. And you take it and you nail it to a tree trunk. So... When you see it like this, when it's either shelf growing off the side of a dead tree or the lower picture, that is coming off the root of a dead tree. But you take this cap when they're still rubbery, like, you know, the pink pet erasers, that hard rubber, but still somewhat flexible. You take that, you take the cap and you nail it to a dead stump uh, with the gills or well in this case it's a polypore so the downside down it will inoculate the stump with the spores and grow um, and i managed to get uh, multiple years worth of reishi uh, that way on an old oak stump in my yard the other thing you can do oops hello <laughs> is go to the fungi perfecti website by Paul Stamets, and you can order uh, reishi spawn. Uh, a couple of different ways. One of them is it will be wooden dowels imp implanted already with the mycelium of the reishi. You drill holes in the dead wood. You stick the dowel in there. You put some wax over the top just to seal it. And a year later, sometimes two, if the wood is kept moist and shaded and you get the hot weather, you get all sorts of reishi growing. So, really cool. One more pretty important question. Uh, someone asked, should you cook puffball mushrooms before you eat them? Okay, here's the thing about wild mushrooms. Cook all wild mushrooms. Uh, they all have some minor amounts of toxicity that needs to be cooked to get rid of. Uh, frankly, in the case of store-bought mushrooms, they often have the same things, but everyone, you know, they'll grab the little white button mushrooms and eat those raw. But truly, to remove all toxicity from mushrooms, they need to be cooked. Um, if you're the type of person like right now is uh, panicking over the LaCroix water thing with the trace amounts of natural products that people think are pesticides, uh, then you don't want to eat raw mushrooms because there is a natural toxicity in all all mushrooms the edible ones are ones that they figured out that they have to cook first to you know get rid of everything but uh, with the edible mushrooms cooking them will remove the toxins in the case of puffballs one of the easiest things to do is cut them into slices batter them and fry them up uh, really 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 good that way oh wow okay so we got one minute left here and then the show is over so one more time scout and seller if you see there you know we have the you, uh, URL there, the tinyurl.com mark wine. I got a coupon code. Funny story, my younger daughter 
kind of freaked out when she heard I have a coupon code for the Workman's Friend Barrier Skin Cream that my company makes. If you buy this from Amazon and you put in the code MARKLIVE, you get $3 off it. And now with the Scout and Seller, if you go to the tinyurl.com slash markwine, uh, it's a special deal there too. So pretty cool. Uh, at this point, uh, wow, I guess it's time to say goodbye. Again, I managed to fill a whole hour. You have no idea the panic that goes through at the beginning of this each day, you know, each show. Um, we've done five now, and I still feel like I'm flying by the seat of my pants, and it kind of probably looks that way. But like I said, let me know what you want next week's show to be about. Uh, you know, I'm leaning towards medicinal plants or medicinal medicinal mushrooms. I think that would be a great topic. Um, and then, until then, be nice to each other. In fact, be excellent to each other and drink wine. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. I'm going to finish this bottle. And then, I, hey, there she is, my Bye. older daughter. Uh, okay, see you next week. Bye-bye. Yes.